This is Donna Warren at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point, and today I would like to talk about how we can use argument mapping to help us to supply missing premises in an argument. Supplying missing premises in an argument is a technique that is often used to evaluate inferences. It's an evaluation technique. Here is the idea. Suppose we have a simple inference like this, only one idea on top. This can generalize, this technique generalizes for more ideas on top, but I'm just going to talk about one for the sake of simplicity. Suppose we have a reason going down to a conclusion, and we're wondering if this inference is strong. What we can do is we can supply the missing premise that someone must believe if they are to find this inference compelling. In other words, what do I need to believe along with believing R if I'm going to conclude C? Once we've identified that, we can evaluate it and ask, is that the sort of thing that I should believe? If so, then the inference is pretty strong because it doesn't assume too much. If the hidden assumption or the missing premise is just a whopper, then the inference is bad because it assumes things that might not be true. Essentially what we're going to be doing is plugging this gap with the missing premise and then measuring the size of the gap by evaluating the missing premise necessary to plug it. Okay? Now, to get sort of an intuition for how we're going to go about this, we can consider my favorite technique of all time so far, the puzzle piece technique. Okay. Imagine that we have a shape like this. And we know that we're going to be adding something to it in order to get a shape like this. We can figure out what the missing shape has to look like, right? I mean, it's probably not going to have a square jutting out because we know that this square comes from this. Instead, the missing shape will have to combine the uncommon outlines of this shape and the shape that we're going to get. In other words, it's going to have to somehow combine the circle and the triangle. It connects up the uncommon. And this is important. It has to be in the right order. If we had the triangle here, it's not going to, it's not going to hook up with the circle. We need to have the circle first in order to do the joining, followed by the triangle. So, what we would need, and I'm just going to move this over, and I am going to put the missing, when I supply something that's missing, I'm going to use the yellow post-it, like that. Note, this, this missing premise, or this missing puzzle piece, is composed out of the uncommon shapes of the original reason and the conclusion. In other words, the circle and the triangle. And the circle comes first. The uncommon bit of the reason comes before the uncommon bit in the conclusion. Okay, so let's try this with English. And I'm just going to leave the plus there because we're going to be adding ideas to it. Suppose that I know that Elliot owns a poodle. And I conclude that Elliot owns a dog. The first thing we want to do is identify the common concepts between the reason and the conclusion. And we should make this unit as big as we can. So even though this has Elliot in common and so does this, we can do better than that. Elliot owns A. Elliot owns A. That's what's in common between the reason and the conclusion. That's the biggest common bit. So we know that the missing premise has to be composed of the leftover bits. Well, what's left over from the top? Poodle. What's left over from the bottom? Dog. We put those together we get 
poodle dog. Okay, that's, that's kind of phase one, just identifying what concepts are going to need to go in this thing. Um, now we need to make sure that we put them together in the right order. In order to do that, think of an if-then sentence, have the leftover notion in the reason, in this case poodle, be the part that goes after the if, and the leftover part in the conclusion, in this case dog, be the part that goes after the then. So we get, if poodle, then dog. Now, that's not a coherent English sentence. That's not grammatical. So let's make it a little bit more grammatical. There. If something's a poodle, then it's a dog. Now, we can stop there if we want. Elliot owns a poodle. If something's a poodle, then it's a dog. Therefore, Elliot owns a dog. This is the missing, whoops, sorry. This is the missing premise, right? Now, that's what someone needs to believe in order to go from here to here. Is that something one should believe? I think so. If you're a poodle, you've got to be a dog. So, this inference was just fine. It didn't ask anyone to assume too much when it went from the premise to the conclusion. Now, if we want to, we could rephrase it again. Instead of saying, if something's a poodle, then it's a dog, we might think it just sounds more natural to say poodles are dogs. That's fine. We can rephrase as often as we want. The point isn't to stop at the if-then sentence. The point is to go through the if-then sentence and to make sure you have the right one. Okay. Um, I want to just talk a little bit here about an easy mistake to make when people are asked to come up, you know, to figure out what the missing assumption is. And I'm going to go back to the if-then sentence because it's the one that I tend to have in my mind. Now let's suppose we don't have this yet. And here's a bad way to ask someone to come up with a missing premise. And unfortunately, it's the way that sometimes people are asked. Sometimes people are asked, if someone says this, what are they assuming? If someone says, Elliot owns a poodle, therefore Elliot owns a dog, what are they assuming? What must be true? That's way too vague. And so people tend to answer by responding, saying things like, um, oh, it probably Elliot, Elliot's a dog lover, right? Or an, or an animal lover. And I think um, something else that I would have to assume is that Elliot has some amount of disposable income, right? Okay, fine. All of those things are sort of assumptions here, but they're not this assumption. This assumption is a very particular one. It's the assumption that's necessary to plug the gap, right? That's all that we're thinking. That's why that recipe, what are the leftover concepts? Put them together where it's if top level leftover concept, then bottom level leftover concept. Top level, top level, bottom level, right? That will give you the right missing premise. And then we evaluate it to see if the inference is any good. Let's do another one. Suppose that um, having concluded that Elliot owns a dog, I use that as a premise to conclude that Elliot must be trustworthy. So Elliot owns a dog, Elliot's trustworthy. What's the missing premise? What must be assumed here? Well, what are the common concepts between the reason and the conclusion? Elliot. So now, what are the uncommon concepts? Owns a dog, trustworthy. So we know that those are the concepts out of which our missing premise will be constructed. Owns a dog, trustworthy. But we know that they're going to be constructed in a particular order. It's going to be if the missing concept from the reason, then the missing concept from the conclusion. It's going to be an if-then sentence in that order. So if owns a dog, then trustworthy, like so. 
But again, this isn't a coherent English sentence, so we should probably rephrase it. If someone owns a dog, then that person is trustworthy. Now let's rephrase it again. We wouldn't have to. We could stop at this if then, but to me, that so this, 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 if, this if then sounds a little artificial. I probably wouldn't say, if someone owns a dog, then that person is trustworthy. I would probably say something like, dog owners are trustworthy. Same idea, right? Good, so we've evaluated, we've identified rather, what missing premise has to be believed if someone is going to go from this reason to this conclusion. If someone concludes that Elliot is trustworthy on the basis of the fact that Elliot owns a dog, they have to be assuming this. That's what plugs the gap. Now, should they assume that? You know, is it the case that dog owners are trustworthy? Not necessarily, right? There are some awful people in history who have owned dogs. <laughs> There are some very untrustworthy people who have owned dogs. So, unlike the previous argument, this inference asks us to assume something that just isn't true. What that tells us is the inference is pretty bad. The gap between the reason and the conclusion is just far too wide. So, now you know how to add missing premises, how to uncover hidden assumptions. Many people think that is a very hard thing to do but you now know how to do it. Go you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.